Praise the Lord, everyone. It is 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. We normally would, of course, do our Bible study on um, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. However, uh, I had to spend the night in the hospital yesterday. And so, in order to uh, assure that we do not have a gap in our Bible study, series, I wanted to make sure that we were able to um, to have Bible study this week. I don't want a gap in the series, so I want to uh, make certain we have a session this week. So, we're doing it tonight instead. For those who won't be able to watch live, seeing as we're on Thursday rather than Wednesday, we'll have it posted. We'll have our regular video posted so that folks can watch it at their convenience, of course, on uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll be doing that as we normally would do. And this way, we will not miss our Bible study for this week, okay? Um, I just got out of the hospital literally about 5.30 Tommy and I had to run by the pharmacy, and then we ran straight to the house. So if I look a little bit disheveled or uh, messy or anything, I hope that you will uh, excuse me. I had to pull myself together, get everything thrown together real quick for uh, so we could go on the air at 7. So I hope you'll pardon me if I don't look just all together right, okay? All right. We want to begin our session this evening with a word of prayer. So I invite you, if you would, to bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before the throne of grace tonight, O God, boldly, as your word declares, it's our privilege as children of God. Master, we need the anointing, the touch from heaven. We need the presence and power of God to reside upon both the teacher and the student if we're to receive by revelation the truths of your word which are able to set the captives free. Anoint every ear today, Lord, that hears that hearts might be prepared to receive from your word today by your spirit. Touch my tongue. Lord, I rushed in today so we could do this and not have any gaps in our study series. I need the touch of the Holy Ghost if I'm to be effective tonight in communicating your word to your people. Move by your spirit. Reveal yourself in a brand new way to all those that are watching and listening, whether they be live or whether it be by reason of recording. We ask all this in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, we are looking at the topic of um, all things paranormal from a Christian biblical perspective. Uh, what we are titling this series is Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. And uh, we did, I did a teaching on this subject matter many years ago in our church in Dallas, and it wound up being uh, one of our most watched series. And we had literally garnered tens of thousands of views uh, on our videos in that series. So I thought it might be wise for us to do this same subject matter here in Huntsville now that we've moved our ministry to Alabama, and uh, that way we'll have this study series on our Huntsville Church channel. And, uh, and hopefully it'll benefit people in this area in particular, and those that watch us online, uh, you get a refresher. Uh, we did our Paranormal 101 series quite a few years ago, so it's been a good while ago. Uh, I think it's more than time for 
a refresher. We are looking at the fact that, um, let me just try to do this a little bit. Hold on one second. We're looking at the reality of the fact that there is absolutely a spiritual world. We started out our study. I'm doing a quick repeat here. We started out our study looking at the need for God's people to understand that Scripture, the Word of God, is our sure foundation. We have to be committed to the Word of God as our foundation. That is imperative. Many of these ghost chasers and ghost hunters and psychics and self-proclaimed paranormal experts run around quoting theories and guesses and opinions and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I was actually watching a show last night and um, while I was in the hospital, and uh, it cracked me up because um, there were two individuals working together. One is a skeptic, and the other is an absolute believer in the paranormal. And uh, while the skeptic was offering possible explanations for various things that people had experienced at this particular location that they were investigating, the, uh, the lady who is absolutely convinced of ghosts and what have you, you know, she's just shirking him off, you know. Oh, well, that's, that's dumb. No, you know, that, that has to be ghosts. That has to be. And I was sitting there and I'm watching this and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this woman goes in with her mind made up so that every pitter-patter of mouse feet that she hears, she's convinced it's children running through the building, you know. Uh, every little noise, every little thing that happens, she's convinced. But she's convinced before she ever goes in. So it's not a matter of anything or anyone having to convince her of anything. She's fully convinced before she ever walks in the building. And, of course, the other guy was more skeptical, looking for uh, scientific explanations for various phenomena and experiences that people have had. From a biblical Christian perspective, we do not deny under any circumstances that the spirit realm exists and that it is real. There absolutely is a spirit realm. God is a spirit. Therefore, if God is a spirit, then there has to be a spirit realm, if for no other reason but to accommodate God himself. But then we also have looked at uh, the creations of God, who are also spiritual beings, uh, which are called angels. And we looked at the angels. Today, we're going to begin to look at the concept of spiritual warfare. And we're going to look at the other side of the coin. Again, another part of the spirit realm, which is uh, in opposition to God. It never ceases to amaze me how fundamentalists are so fraught with and I grew up in a fundamentalist church, so again, I don't say this, folks, to be mean. I don't say it because I'm hateful or spiteful. No, not at all. Uh, my problem is I tend to be very plain spoken, and I don't mince a lot of words. Uh, so I just say the way I feel it. Fundamentalism is fraught with contradiction and uh, it thrives, as I've said before, it thrives on hypocrisy and contradiction. There are so many principles and teachings of the Word of God that fundamentalist Christianity just runs roughshod over um, in many of its teachings. When you look at fundamentalist teaching concerning uh, spiritual warfare and the opposite side 
of the spirit realm. You know, in other words, we have God and angels on this side. Then we have the devil and demons on this side. When we're looking at fundamentalist teaching as it relates to um, the devil and demons, for instance, it's as if God is reacting to circumstances that occurred <clears throat> prior to the creation of man, and uh, he's reacting to Satan's disobedience and his rebellion. He's responding to uh, the devil's rebellious nature and casting him out of heaven, and that's how evil came into existence. No, it is not. No, it is not. God has never reacted to anything in all of eternity. The Word of God teaches that God knows the end from the beginning, meaning He knows what's going to happen before it has even begun. Before it's even started, He knows how it's going to end, okay? And for that reason, it is impossible to teach that he created Lucifer to be this one thing, not knowing that Lucifer was going to rebel and ultimately become the god of this world or the overseer of this world. No, God created him for that very purpose. The Word of God said that God raised up Pharaoh for the purpose of standing in opposition to the children of Israel leaving the land of Egypt. You say, well, why would God create someone and put them in power at a certain time in history so that he could oppose the will of God? Well, it was easy because God was wanting to show uh, his might and his power. He was wanting to reveal himself, the one true God, over the gods of Egypt. And in order to do that, he had to have a pharaoh or a leader in Egypt who would oppose the people of God's exodus. Therefore, he put a man in that position at that moment to do that very thing. So, when he created Lucifer, he designed Lucifer, listen carefully, he designed Lucifer with certain characteristics which allowed him to be subject to pride, that allowed him to be subject to to arrogance, that allowed him to be subject to vanity, that allowed him to be subject to jealousy, okay? God designed him that way so that he could do exactly what he did, so he could become exactly what he became. Because again, <clears throat> there's another principle taught in fundamentalist Christianity, which they contradict all day, every day with so much of their teaching. And that is that mankind was designed with freedom of choice. God wanted a people who would choose to love him, choose to serve him, who would choose to walk in relationship with him. In order for humanity to have a choice, there had to be the elements existent for a choice to be made. Had God created man and all that existed was heaven, God, angels, good, holiness, righteousness, if that's all that existed, then man would have had no choice. There would have been no choice to be made. Therefore, he had to create the other side of the coin. He literally designed and created his own opposition. He created, as it were, uh, we uh, human beings, we create computers 
that are capable of playing games against us. I love to play Scrabble. And uh, sometimes uh, I'll pl I often play against the computer. I'm not playing against another person. Someone designed a program that allows the computer to play against a human opponent. And uh, that's usually how I play. I don't bother messing with trying to play against other people. I just play against the computer. God designed his own opposition. The wonderful part of this reality is when we understand this, we understand then that the outcome is guaranteed because God designed everything to work exactly as it works. And in the final analysis, everything, good and bad, answers to him. Everything. There is nothing outside of his control. There is nothing outside of his purview. Now, what he did... At creation, he established certain rules, and we're going to be looking into these in the weeks to come as part of our ongoing study. We're going to look at the rules that apply to the spirit realm, because God set certain rules in place so that uh, his opposition could serve a purpose and it could play a role, but it is confined. It has certain rules that it must follow. If you've ever watched the wonderful movie, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and there is that wonderful scene where uh, the lion is meeting with that uh, wicked, you know, witch woman, and uh, she is quoting the rules to him, what the rules are concerning the young uh, boy who has done a certain thing, and, you know, and he, she's quoting to the lion the rules, and he roars back at her and says, you know, don't tell me about the rules. I wrote the rules. Well, that is exactly the truth uh, that literally represents God speaking to the enemy of our soul and saying, you don't have to quote the rules to me. I wrote the rules, okay? I'm the one who said there are certain parameters, there are certain boundaries. You cannot go outside of this. You cannot go beyond this. If you wish to do this, you must do this. All of these things have been put in place by God. Knowing this, we should understand as God's people that uh, we, through Jesus Christ, have God given authority. And therefore, all of these elements, instead of causing us to be fearful, instead of them causing us trepidation and anxiety, we should walk triumphantly and victoriously and powerfully through the world, not fearing the enemy, not fearing what the, the devil can do and how he can represent himself and how he can roar and thunder, because we know that in the final analysis, the rules are set. He cannot step outside of those boundaries, and he has to abide by certain parameters which God himself has established, okay? Now, God had to create opposition. He had to create darkness to contrast the light, or light to contrast the darkness, because you cannot choose light if light is all that exists. Neither can you be blamed for not choosing the light if all that exists is darkness.
So we understand in the spirit realm, there is a battle. There is a conflict that is taking place. In Ephesians 6 and 12, the word of God reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The term principalities is a Greek word, arche, which is defined as um, the person or thing that commences, or the first person or thing in a series, the leader, that by which anything begins to be, the origin or the active cause, the extremity of a thing. So principalities speaks of rule, magistrates, both on the angelic side and on the demonic side, there are layers of authority. There are um, hierarchy. There is hierarchy. Okay? It is structured. It is organized. And again, when you understand spiritual warfare, you understand this. Uh, it, it's an extremely important truth to understand. And there, we're going to get into it again in the course of this study. Folks, there is so much material to cover in teaching on this subject that I have to try to kind of keep it organized and, and kind of delay getting into certain things till a later date. Because otherwise, it would just be like, you know, going all over the map. There are so many areas to cover. But there is hierarchy. Uh, we'll be looking at it later. Jesus said, when you go uh, into a house to overcome a house, for instance, he said, the first thing you're going to do is bind the strong man. You are going to find the strongest person in that structure, in that kingdom, and you are going to make sure that the strongest individual first is subdued, okay? You don't want the strongest guy running around fighting the longest part of the battle. No, you want to get him dispatched and out of the way as quickly as possible. The same thing is true when you're dealing with demons and you're dealing with demonic spirits, you have to understand there are going to be privates that you're dealing with, meaning lower level, kind of the weaker, the less, uh, those that have less authority and less power. But you're also going to have the strong man to deal with. You're going to have those that are higher up in the hierarchy that have more power and more authority. Now listen, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we're dealing with hierarchy. We're dealing with structure. It's important to understand, folks, the notion of a little red devil with a pointed tail and a pitchfork running around the world just trying to tempt people here and there is not how it works. No, no, no. No. The enemy is immensely structured. When you understand how he works, when you understand how that side fights, then you are much, much, much better able to walk in victory, to attain victory, and to maintain victory. Said so not only do we wrestle against principalities, but also against powers, which is exosia, a Greek word, meaning um, uh, authority or 
uh, the power of judicial decisions, authority to manage, okay, a thing that is subject to authority, rule, or jurisdiction, one who possesses authority. So, again, we have hierarchy. That means with hierarchy you have authorities, okay? You have governments, you have local government, city government, county government, state government, national government. And within each of those layers of government, those are your principalities. But within the principalities, you have authorities. You have mayors, you have uh, city councilmen, you have um, governors, you have presidents, you have congressmen and senators. So within the structure, there are those who have authority. Then you have those who work within government who don't really have any authority. They work at the DMV or they work at the tax office. They don't have any authority. They just uh, do a job. Okay, they're working under the authority of someone else. Then it says that uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Well, obviously, we know what rulers are. Those are the highest levels of authority those who are at the highest levels. A governor would not be a ruler, whereas a president, now of course in a democracy, a president is not a ruler. But if you were in a kingdom where they have a king, then the king is the ruler, even though he may have governors and overseers over various uh, areas of the country that he is the sovereign over. Okay, now, in Matthew 11 and 12, the word of God said, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So Jesus was telling us that there is a literal warfare. There is literal combat that goes on in the heavens. This is not some fictitious notion. This is a literal combat that goes on. And we are dealing with a structured, organized enemy. And he thinks he has a plan. He thinks he knows how to win the battle. But the problem is, God designed him, and God put him within certain boundaries and within a certain framework, and there's nothing in the universe he can do as much as in his vanity. He's convinced himself he is able to do otherwise. He cannot because he has been designed to be unable to go outside of the parameters which God has set for him. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 9, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Again, we see Michael is one of the principalities. He is not the ruler, but he is one of the principalities. God is the ruler, but Michael is one of the authorities under him. And there were certain instances in Scripture where the enemy had a vested interest in obtaining the body of Moses. And some might say, well, why on earth would the devil have a vested interest in obtaining the body of Moses? God specifically spirited away the body of Moses and caused him 
to be buried and caused him to be hidden, his body to be hidden. And he did that because there is a tendency in man to deify high figures, especially in religious circles. Look at the tomb of Muhammad. People make pilgrimages uh, every year to this tomb because he is their highest holiest figure in the Islamic religion. And God said, I don't want anybody worshiping, deifying, adoring Moses. And they will build a shrine to him. They will wind up building a temple to him, and it will become idolatry. He said, I'm not going to have that. So I'm going to personally see to it that the body of Moses. But now the enemy would be more than happy for people to be led away into idolatry and into the adoration and worship of Moses. He'd be more than happy for people to do that. So he was trying to see if he was not able to get hold of Moses' body so that it could remain somewhere where it could be revered and it could be honored and where they could build a temple and a sepulcher to Moses, okay? So the enemy has a vested interest in anything that draws us away from God. Anything that stands in the way of a higher knowledge of the living God, Satan has an invested interest in. And we're going to learn as we go further in this study that this is what motivates him in every single thing that he does. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, listen, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. That is the enemy's primary objective. He exalts things. He builds things up in people's minds. He builds things up in people's belief systems that literally stand in opposition to a higher knowledge or a deeper knowledge of God. He tries to establish um, deceptions that will cause people to believe contrary to that which God has spoken and established in his word. This is why believers have to be sold out and committed entirely and completely to the word of God. Because the enemy is standing in the sidelines looking for every opportunity to introduce some element, something that will cause you to call into question the word of God. He said, we wrestle not against our warfare is not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. What are imaginations? Well, in a nutshell, it's a lot of what you hear on these ghost programs. It's opinions. It's man-made thought. It is uh, anything that is born in the mind of man that does not have as its foundation the Word of God. He said, casting down imaginations and every, every, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, listen, every thought to the obedience of Christ. By the end of this study, it is my hope that God's people will have been equipped and taught and trained so that 
everything you watch, everything you read, everything you hear, you balance against the Word of God. Okay? You're bringing into captivity every thought. You don't allow your thoughts to run wild. You don't allow your thought processes and your beliefs to begin to go off in directions where they ought not to go, where they're not uh, subject to the Word of God. No, I bring my thought processes into captivity. I bring them into subjection to the Word of God. Everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, I bring any stray thought, any stray belief, and I bring it right back, and I weigh it against the Word of God, and I stand on the Word of God. Okay, now we read about the Antichrist and we see his mission and his work uh, is exactly what we have just read concerning our spiritual enemy. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4, speaking of the Antichrist, the word of God said, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist. Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist, my friend, is not merely going to stand in opposition to the God of Israel. He is not only going to stand in opposition to Jehovah God who has revealed himself to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, he's going to literally stand in opposition to all that is called God. He doesn't want the Hindus worshiping their gods either. He wants them worshiping him. He doesn't want the Muslims worshiping Allah either. He wants them worshiping him. All that is called God. The problem is, in the end time, there's only one true God. There's only one real God. And in the end, that God is going to come down from heaven riding upon a white horse, and he is going to defeat Satan and his forces at the Battle of Armageddon. And it, the, the reason you're not going to see Buddha and you're not going to see uh, Allah and you're not going to see this one and that one and the myriad of Hindu gods is because the truth is there's not but one true God. And that God is going to reveal himself as the one and only God in the last days as he comes from heaven to defend himself. There's an important spiritual principle there for people who think that they need to defend the Lord. Honey, you don't never have to defend the Lord. God is well able of defending himself. There is nothing in the world you can do for God, but there is everything in the world that God can do for you. Christians who run around wanting to take offense because somebody speaks something against God or somebody speaks something against the Christian faith are, are just engaging in folly. God does not need you, nor does he want you to defend him. He doesn't need you to defend him. In the end, he will appear to defend him himself. He will defend his own reputation. He will defend his own identity. He will defend his own deity. Now, we talked about we talked about the notion that on the evil side of the coin, uh, there is a hierarchy. In Matthew 12, 24, the word of the Lord reads, but when the Pharisees heard it, 
they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So you see, there is a, hi a hierarchy. Even as Michael is considered one of God's princes, his archangels, even Beelzebub is one of the named princes of Lucifer's armies and Lucifer's side of the spirit realm. In Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So again, I talked about the fact in our earlier study, talking about angels. Angels, uh, the term angels can apply to holy angels or they can apply to evil spirits. You can literally speak of a demon in effect as an angel, okay? Because in the end, they are all spirit beings. They've all been designed for a specific purpose to do a specific job by God himself. Now, in Matthew 12, verse 29, this is what I was talking about a moment ago. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? So the Lord is saying, you can't go into a strong man's house and rob him and steal from him and take uh, his possessions unless first you tie that guy up because as long as he's loose he's going to be able to defend his home and his property the same is true in the spirit realm the enemy oftentimes comes into people's lives and he brings all kinds of uh, trash. He brings all kinds of baggage and all this negative uh, stuff winds up in their lives and you are not going to be able to go in and clean that stuff up unless and until you first bind the strong man. You've got to bind up that spirit that caused all the trouble to begin with. Okay? You're not going to be able to get rid of the things that this spirit has brought into a person's life until you first have bound the strong man. Now we understand on the, on the evil side of the spirit realm, the hierarchy begins with the devil, Lucifer. Okay? We read about him in a number of scriptures. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, we read about him uh, in the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness, listen, to be tempted of the devil. So the Lord was brought to the wilderness specifically for the purpose of being tempted. This was not a chance meeting. He didn't go into the wilderness and the devil just happened to show up and decide to tempt him. No, no, no. God had all this orchestrated. All of this was planned. All of this was laid out. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Why are we as believers committed to the word of God as our foundation? The Lord just told us why. Man cannot live merely by uh, feeding his physical body, but by uh, every word that comes from God. Then the devil, 
taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, now the devil's quoting scripture, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again. You know how I'm constantly talking about the principles, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You know how I'm always talking about the Word of God teaching us, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Lord is calling the enemy's bluff because he's taking something out of context. And he is bringing in another scripture passage in order to bring context to the situation. He said, Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So he said, it's one thing if I were to fall inadvertently and the angels scooped in to prevent me from hurting myself. You know, it's another thing for me to jump. Okay. He said, you don't tempt God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Again, the word of God is our foundation. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord Thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Again, I have to remind people, because there are those who uh, don't understand the concept of the oneness of God, and they see a passage like this, and they say, well, how could Jesus be God if the devil is saying, you know, worship me? And the, the Lord responds and says, no, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I have to repeat once again, one of the primary purposes in the Lord manifesting himself in human form was to set an example for us. The reason that this entire encounter is even in the Word of God is that it sets an example for us. It shows us how we ought to respond when the enemy comes to us and says, hey, if you're a child of God, then why don't you command these stones to be made bread? If you're a child of God, then why don't you throw yourself down from this high place and God will send his angels to protect you because if you pull scripture out of context, that's what it says he'll do. Forget the fact that it also says you're not to tempt the Lord. And then, of course, the ultimate end for the enemy is that man would worship him as God. That was Satan's intent from the beginning of his fall from heaven. He wants to be worshipped as God. So when the enemy comes to us and says or suggests that we worship him as God, we answer and say, I'm sorry, devil, but the Lord showed me how I'm supposed to answer this. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, In John chapter 8, verse 44, the Lord's having a conversation 
with some scribes and Pharisees who stood in opposition to him. And he said to them, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts or the desires of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. What, did you hear that? There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the very nature of God is truth. The very nature of the enemy is lies and deception. When you understand that, it, it is very easy to understand many things that we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come. The enemy uses every kind of tool at his disposal in order to sow lies and deceptions. His ultimate goal being to cause us to call into question the Word of God, to disbelieve the Word of God. But what is the example that Jesus set for us when tempted by the enemy in the wilderness? We always go back to the Word of God, but not just going back to the Word of God, but going back to the Word of God. How? Rightly divided. Okay? John chapter 13 and 2 talks about uh, Judas betraying the Lord. It said, And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So, we know that there is a devil. There are some people who want to tell you, oh, the devil is just some antiquated concept, you know, that's just some ancient mysticism, you know. There's, no, there's not really an actual figure, the devil. Well, according to the Word of God, there absolutely is, and he is the chief a ruler in the spirit realm on the side that stands in opposition to God. He was designed for that purpose, and he serves that purpose well. In Ephesians 4.27, the Apostle Paul wrote, Neither give place to the devil. What's, if, if the devil isn't real and there really is no devil, then why on earth would Paul be saying this? In Ephesians 6.11, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Yes, there is a devil. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Yes, my friend, there is a devil. 1 Timothy 3 and 6 reads, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 7, Moreover, he must have a good report, speaking of those who would serve as bishops or pastors said he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Second Timothy 2.26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. This is speaking of God manifesting himself in human form, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. 
notice the pronoun is used, him. He said that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So yes, the devil in the word of God is described as a literal figure, a literal spiritual being. This is not just a concept. This is not just, you know, mythology. No, according to the Word of God, the devil absolutely does exist. In James chapter 4 and 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Again, he's referred to as a literal figure, a literal being. In 1 Peter 5 and 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 1 John 3 and 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning, from the beginning. How can anybody say that Lucifer was not designed to do what he did? If the Lord Jesus Christ tells us right here that from the beginning he was disobedient, from the beginning he was rebellious, from the beginning he was proud, okay? So therefore he had to have been designed by God in order to be capable of this for a purpose, so that he might serve his purpose in God's overall divine plan. He that committeth sin is of the devil, 1 John 3 and 8, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 and 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And then lastly, just, just using Scripture to show you that the devil most certainly is absolutely a literal figure uh, represented in the Word of God as a literal figure. You watch, I've, I've seen television shows on the History Channel that literally try to explain away the concept of the devil as a literal personal figure. And they try to say, oh, you know, no, th this is just a mythical thing. You know, the devil's not a, not a real literal being, not a real literal spiritual being. Oh, yes, he is, according to the word of God. Revelation 12 and 9, lastly, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, meaning, again, if you remember, I've taught on this many times. The word and that is translated and in the King James uh, is chi in the Greek. It comes from the base uh, root word chi in the Greek. The word chi can be translated as and. It may also be translated as even. The King James translators oftentimes translated it as and and in the reading, using the word and, you would almost think you're speaking of separate individuals, like God and our Father. Well, obviously, it, it, the writer's not saying that God's here and our Father is over here, that these are separate beings. No, he's referring to the same uh, being. He's referring to God. He's referring to him as both God and and our Father. But had they really translated that the way it ought to have been translated, it would have said, God, even our Father. Because there you see that clearly they're simply using
using two different titles for the same individual. In this instance, that is what is happening. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent, the devil, called the devil and Satan, or even Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I mentioned uh, before in an earlier study, there are those who try to tell you this passage is referring to, you know, a third of the angels being cast out of heaven with Satan. No, wrong. The Lord himself said that uh, there was war going on in heaven. He said every day heaven suffers violence and the violent must take it by force. There's war going on in heaven. This particular passage refers to one battle that is going to take place in the end of, of this age. And it is at that point that God is going to cast him out of the heavens with his angels. Those beings, those spiritual beings which were created to do the work that they do. There are evil spirits. Okay, Angels are called holy angels. Demons, those on the other side of the spiritual realm, are referred to as evil spirits. In Luke chapter 7, verse 21, And in that same hour he, Jesus, cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Luke chapter 8 and 2, And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. Acts chapter 19 and verse 12, So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Acts 19.13 Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus saying we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth so demons are referred to in some instances as evil spirits now they're also referred to as a devil or devils Matthew 4, 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we, excuse me, have cast out devils. Matthew 8, 16, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Matthew 8, 28, and when he was come to the other side into the country of of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. Matthew 8, 31. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go into the herd of swine. Matthew 9, 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. I could go through dozens and dozens of passages of Scripture. I've got them all here, but I'm not going to do it tonight. Uh, where demons, the angels, as it were, that operate with Lucifer, Satan, the devil, uh, he is called the devil, and his henchmen are called devils. And uh, 
They are all operating in the same spirit. They're all operating in the same uh, realm, as it were. And this is one reason why when you cast out demons, you can actually simply say, I rebuke you, Satan, because every devil will answer to that because he is their general. So therefore, if you refer to uh, any demon, any devil as Satan, then y y they understand that, you know, um, you have authority over Satan, therefore you have authority over them, okay? Also, uh, let me see here. Revelation 9.20. I want to read a couple more references where uh, demons are referred to as devils. Revelation 9.20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. So we see in this instance, there are some who literally worship devils or demons. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. They are the spirits of devils, devils. Uh, is one title that is applied to demons. We have uh, evil spirits, wicked spirits, devils. Then you have unclean spirits. Matthew 10 and 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 12, 43, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. In Mark 1, 23, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Mark 1, 26, and when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. Mark 1, 27, and they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. Mark 3.11, and unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. Mark 3.30, because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. Mark 5 and 2, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Again, there are innumerable passages of scriptures where I could, you know, quote, where we see demons referred to, um, hell's angels, so to speak, referred to as unclean spirits. There are a number of titles, a number of terms that are used for demonic entities. Uh, uh, demons is a term you actually don't even read. In the Word of God. That is a term that we understand. Uh, it comes from the Greek, but it, it is a term that we understand applies to all of the above. Uh, unclean spirits, wicked spirits, uh, devils. Okay, now here's an important truth that we're going to end our study with this week. And, and I, I know I kind of breeze through all of this. I'm trying to just establish some very, very basic truths here, okay? Is there a devil? Yes, there's a devil. 
Is he called Satan? Yes, he's called Satan. Was he initially created and called Lucifer? Yes, he was called Lucifer. Does he have angels that serve beneath him? Yes, he does. We refer to them often with the overall uh, umbrella title of demons, but they are referred to in the Word of God as unclean spirits, evil spirits, so on and so forth, devils. Now, here's the truth. Probably going to tick a lot of people off because they don't want to simply believe the Word of God. They want to believe tradition. I'm sorry, folks, I don't have time for foolishness. I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian church, and if that church did anything for me, it taught me that the Word of God is our final authority. And if the Word of God says it, then that's what I believe. And if it doesn't say it, then I don't believe it. Are demons fallen angels? Are demons angels which fell from heaven uh, with Lucifer when he was quote-unquote expelled from heaven. Well, first of all, we know that Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall as lightning. He didn't say anything about expelling Satan from heaven. He said that Satan's rebellion and his sin literally became like weights upon him so that he was fallen. He literally, this is why we talk about fallen man. We talk about uh, people who have fallen into sin. That term is used because it's as if the weight of that sin, this is why scripture said to lay aside the weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Lucifer was not cast out of heaven. He fell from heaven. When he took on uh, the sinful, prideful mindset that he would be as God, he no longer had a place in heaven, and immediately he lost his place. And he literally, like lightning, the Lord said, fell from heaven. So therefore, the notion that he and a third of the angels were expelled from heaven is not supported by Scripture to begin with. But listen, in Second Peter 2 and 4, the Word of God said, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Then in Jude 1 and 6, remember, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In Jude 1 and 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Any angel, any holy angel that was disobedient or rebellious to their design, they were designed to serve God, any holy angel. Now, some people say, well, well when did that ever happen? Read the story of Noah. Read how that in the days of Noah, the word of God said that the sons of God, making reference to the angels, were looking upon the daughters of men, and they wound up manifesting themselves in human form so that they could sexually interact with uh, human women. This is one of the things that was going on that uh, necessitated the great flood. What was happening? I'll tell you what was happening. These angels, listen carefully, because I told you we're going to be talking about the rules that apply to the spirit realm. One of the rules was that the spirit realm was not to interact and interplay with the 
flesh realm or the human realm. But there were angels who went against the rules and they literally took on a human manifestation so that they could sexually interact with human women. And the word of God said that the children that were born out of these unholy unions wound up becoming giants. They were really large strong men. Many of the characters that we read about in antiquity that are supposed to be fables may very well have been real characters like Hercules and these sort of characters. They were not um, demigods. They were not uh, the byproducts of the byproduct of God interacting with uh or gods interacting with women like the Roman gods. Uh, that's not what took place. But angels interacted with women, and children were born, and these children were excessively large and excessively strong. And this is one of the reasons why God chose to destroy the world by flood, because some angels had broken the rules that applied to the spirit realm. But what did God do with those angels? Did they become demons? Did they become unholy uh, spirits? Did they become unclean spirits or devils? No. The Word of God says twice in Jude and in Peter, it says they were placed in chains in hell reserved for judgment. And then we've read elsewhere where the Apostle Paul said, don't you realize that one day we're going to sit in judgment of angels? What angels? Those angels which are currently bound in hell awaiting judgment. No. Demons are not fallen angels, folks. Let's read further. According to the word of God, disobedient angels were placed in chains and held in reserve in hell for later judgment. So the fallen angels are not demons, and demons are not fallen angels. Demons were specifically designed to do what they do. But as with all angels, whether they be good or evil, they too answer to the Lord and receive their direction from Him. This should empower all of God's people. We should understand and know that ultimately God Himself is the boss, as it were, of all spiritual beings, and they must all receive their limitations and instructions from him. In Job, we read of this. In Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The term sons of God is often referred to angels, again, because angels were God's first creations. They were his first servants, and they were, in effect, his children, simply by reason of he created them, okay? So he is their, uh, their father, they're his children, his sons, in the sense that he is their creator, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in all in the earth 
a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? He said, does, does Job serve you for no reason at all? He said, Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So the enemy is saying to the Lord, you've put a hedge of protection around him. I can't touch him. God sets the parameters. He says, I can't touch him. You've put a hedge around him. The reason he serves you is because you protect him. Everything he owns, his children, his family, his cattle, everything he owns, you put a great big hedge of protection around them. And that's why he serves you. And then he goes on to say, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So the enemy says, the only reason that Job serves you is because you have this hedge of protection. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that God sets the parameters. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord. Notice there were parameters. Satan could not overstep the boundaries. He could not uh, act contrary to the rules, as it were. God had put a hedge around Job, and Satan couldn't touch him until such time as the Lord gave him permission to do so. Okay, and he in effect removed that hedge and said, okay, you want to see if he'll curse me to my face? You want to see if the only reason he's serving me is because I've blessed him and protected him and done all this for him? He said, go ahead, put him to the test. He had a lot of confidence in Job. Then in Job chapter 2, once again, verses 1 through 6, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So notice that the Satan is still answering to God. He's warring against God. He's fighting with God. And yet at the same time, he cannot break out of the fact and the reality that he still, as much as it might drive him insane, he still must answer to God. He still has to give account of himself to God. Oh, children of God, that ought to excite you out of your mind. When you understand these things, it puts this whole uh, fear and terror of the devil, it puts that foolishness to rest when you understand how this really works. So again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence camest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth evil, and still... He holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. 
And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, listen, but save his life. Once again, the Lord gave him access to literally touch Job's body and to vex him physically. He said, but you cannot take his life. So once again, the enemy is confined by God's mandate and God's rules. Children, I got news for you today. Instead of running around like so many Christians do in the world today, oh, the devil's doing this to me. The devil's doing that to me. Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil. You need to understand, Satan has no power over you. He has no power over you whatsoever. If God allows him to exercise any kind of influence or power in your life. It is ultimately uh, for the purpose of sharpening you, purging you. It's like putting gold through the fire in order to purge out the elements that would otherwise pollute it to purify you, okay? All things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Therefore, we understand as children of God, we, we should understand every minute of every day, whatever our circumstance, whatever's happening, God is in control. The word of God says he will not permit us to be tempted above that which we're unable to bear. But with every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Sons of God, as it is used in Job, is a term often employed in Scripture when speaking of, listen, both angels and demons. It is used in a broad sense as all spiritual beings are in effect in the same family as God himself, meaning they are strictly spiritual beings. God is both spirit and at the same time he is the father, the creator of these beings. In Ephesians chapter 3, for this cause I bow, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The notion that one-third of the angels fell with Lucifer from heaven is, is extracted from one biblical passage, but if you read this passage in context, it is clear that it describes the last day's assault upon heaven by the devil, Lucifer, and his demons. But they are defeated and cast back down to earth where Satan is filled with rage, knowing his time is short. We read this in Revelation 12, 7 through 12. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Folks, this is not talking about 
Satan's fall from heaven, not by a million miles. This is talking, he, they're saying this is the guy who's been accusing the saints. This is the guy who's been accusing uh, God's people day and night. So obviously, this is referring to a post-church time in history, not going back to the very beginning of creation. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. This is clearly not talking about Satan's fall from heaven. This is talking about uh, 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 after the church age. The idea that demons are fallen angels has no other biblical support. Defying the Lord's own edict out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We read that in Deuteronomy 17 and 6, as well as Deuteronomy 19 and 15. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Deuteronomy 19, 15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Satan's fall is described by the Lord himself, not as Satan being cast out of heaven, but rather as him falling. Luke chapter 10, 18, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now listen, both angels, I'm going to finish this today if you'll, if you'll indulge me about 10 minutes, okay? I want to be able to finish this section so next week we can move on to new uh, stuff. We're going to start looking at uh, the rules that apply to the spirit realm and that sort of thing. Um, both angels and demons, in other words, all spiritual beings, are able to disguise themselves. In Hebrews 13 and 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So angels are able to manifest themselves uh, as a human being. They're, you know, they're able to do this and appear as something um, different than as an angel, okay? 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, in the, um, in a more modern translation reads, and no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So Satan is able to disguise himself as literally as the holy angel. There is an entire cult that was founded in America, the Mormon religion, which is based on an angel supposedly appearing to a young man named Joseph Smith 
and telling him all Christian religions are wrong. All Christian religions are teaching falsehoods. Um, I've been sent so that I can help you find the one true way. And the word of God says, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. In Genesis 19, 1 through 3, we read how the angels with the Lord appeared manifested as men. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. So Sodom, here he, uh, Sodom, uh, Lot, here Lot is speaking to angels, but they're appearing to him as men who are sojourning, who are traveling and simply passing through Sodom as part of their, uh, one of the legs of their journey. Now, in reference to, to demons manifesting themselves, I talked about this a few moments ago, Genesis 6, 1 through 5. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit will not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination, you remember the word imagination, as it applied to spiritual warfare, casting down imaginations, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then we read in Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, where an angel again physically manifests itself uh, to Peter. I'm almost done, folks. After this, I have one more passage. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. So the angel literally kind of gave Peter a shove to wake him up. Okay, so he had to be manifested in a physical form to physically be able to uh, move Peter. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him. So he's following what appears to be a man, but it's the angel of God. And followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate, that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out 
and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Okay, lastly, uh, we're talking about the fact that angels are able to manifest themselves in, in any form. You know, they can take on any image, any form they wish, whether it be a holy angel or whether it be a demon. They all have the power to do this. Remember this, because in future studies, this is going to be important. Acts chapter 27, 21 through 24. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and have not loosed from Crete and to have gained this much harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Okay, so... Hopefully tonight, I, I know I breached through that real fast. I'm trying to get, to be honest with you, I'm trying to get to the, the meat of this study and, and to the, the uh, subject matter that I know a lot of you are, are especially looking forward to. But there's a lot of foundational um, information that I have to establish first. And so now we understand there is a spirit realm, there's God, angels, there's Lucifer, Satan, the devil, and his angels, or devils, demons, unclean spirits, how, what, wicked spirits, whatever you want to call them. They are at war. They are at war by design, and there is structure. There is organization. This is not a haphazard thing by any stretch of the imagination. And what we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come, uh, beginning next week, are some of the rules and the limits that uh, these spirits operate within. Okay, uh, We're going to understand how they function, how, what they're able to do, what they're not able to do, that sort of thing, okay? And I think you'll be really blessed by it. I hope for all my moving like a freight train this week, uh, I didn't want us to lose out on a session. I, I didn't want this week to go by and us not to have this session because I want to move through this entire study and I want you to, uh, to get to the stuff that we're trying to get to. And so it was important to me that we do this this week. And I hope that you found some information and inspiration in what we've talked about this week. Let's close our Bible study with a word of prayer. Master, once again, God, we thank you for the word of the Lord. It is our firm foundation. We place our confidence, our trust in every word that you have spoken every word, Lord, that you have committed to this great divine text. We place our faith and confidence in it. We believe, God, that it is sure, it is dependable, it is tried. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Master, it's exciting today to understand that there is nothing in this world in the spirit realm that does not ultimately answer to you. There is not anything in this spirit realm that does not have to operate within the confines and the perimeters set forth by our God. And Master, the enemy has no power over a child of God. The word of God declaring 
that the angels of God encamp round about them that fear him, even as Job had a hedge about him. Even so today, Lord, your people have a hedge about them. And Lord, you may raise uh, at times that hedge in order that we might be iron sharpened by iron, that the gold might be tried in the fire, purified, made purer by reason of some trial or some uh, difficulty. But in the end, you are working something good for us. Oh, Master, how wonderful to know that our God is in control and nothing is outside of the parameter of his knowledge or his control. Master, keep this teaching in our minds. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon it so that as we come into our next study, we come in with a sure foundation upon which to build and understand this subject matter that we now study. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word. We ask all this today and none other but Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I hope you will come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for our church service here in Huntsville, Alabama. If you live in the Huntsville area, we need you to come out and help us. Come on, folks. I'm telling you, if, if we can do what God has given us a vision to do, we are going to rock this city. And we are going to have a positive impact on our community, on our state, and on our nation. And God knows we need that at this hour. And also, of course, join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time as we continue our study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night, All Things Paranormal from a Biblical Christian Perspective. Till we see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is my prayer.